One thing I learned from my father and one thing that I've carried with me to this day is that he valued his daughters. It is refreshing to hear a man, and a remarkable one at that, bravely vocalising his recognition in support for the inclusion and value of women. As a woman, I have no rights in this town to be heard in the main square or the main church. Women have been regarded as the fairer, more contemptuous, weaker sex for a substantial period of our history. Before she left this world, I, I would have given anything so she could have witnessed some small change towards a fairer and justified land. There is a fundamental lack of reason here. How is half the nation supposed to speak for the entirety of Women it? and animals need to have rights in law. How can our opinion be less valid than a man's when without women we would not have I cannot more. fully comprehend why we are met with such hostility when all we wish to do is to end the perpetual unfairness this country has endured for far too Having long. Having two daughters is a constant reminder that we are not anywhere close to equality in respect of their I future urge prospects. and encourage everyone to assist in this campaign by whatever means they feel they can. Supporting the petition by any and all means necessary has become quite the familial campaign. Imagine the good that we can do, the changes that we can make. A right for all to vote is a vote for all that is right. I am fortunate to have inspirational family and friends in my life. People whose values I share and whose political stance I respect and agree with. Consideration enabled by intelligence was deemed highly important in my childhood. My mother and father would encourage honesty and integrity, the greatest and yet most challenging of virtues. In my household, we had a lot of healthy debates and discussions, and it was through these that we developed a confidence to express our opinion and to express the reasoning behind why we felt a certain way. But more importantly, we were always encouraged to have an opinion. We would discuss topics that most would deem highly unsuitable for younger ladies, but I was always so fascinated by the worldly wisdom my father and mother would impart. I remember as a young girl asking my father why my mother did not join him to vote. He picked me up and in the most tender voice I ever heard him speak, he told me that the country was not yet ready to embrace the woman's view on the world, but that one day it would be and that I would be there to see it. One thing I learned from my father, and one thing that I've carried with me to this day, is that he valued his daughters. And this gave me hope. It gave me hope that if he could understand this simple ideology, that women are of importance, then perhaps others could too. It astounds me that educated men and women of this town voice such opposition to our cause. I have personally witnessed verbal aggression which is completely unwarranted. I cannot fully comprehend why we are met with such hostility when all we wish to do is to end the perpetual unfairness this country has endured for far too long. One woman ran across to us and said, 
Women should only be concerned with the welfare of their husbands and their families. Soon other women chorused in. One said, Women are not suited to the conflict and unpleasantness of politics. We should rise above it. I remain as passionate as ever. We must stand together in the face of this hostility. We must keep going. We must campaign for the vote for all women. The vote is vital to improve the lives of women. How are women with several children at home on a very low income able to access mainstream society? To be visible, especially when they have not the education which should absolutely be afforded to them. As a woman, I have no rights in this town to be heard in the main square or the main church, which is why when Frances Power Cobb came to preach at the chapel, I was so excited. She was well known. Frances Power Cobb came and delivered a sermon like I had never heard from a woman. She stood in our pulpit and she spoke with such passion about the suffragist movement, about how women and animals need to have rights in law. And of course, I realized that Women and animals have equal rights in that they have no rights. Before I married, my family and I lived at the Wakefield House of Correction. I was not overly concerned with politics. My father vocalised his opinion that politics sometimes got in the way of getting things done. And my mother accepted this, along with her place in society and, and by my father's side. However, when we were alone, we would discuss at length why the country seemed so against including women in any decision making. And this would often lead to questions regarding the vote and why our sex were excluded. My mother would round up the conversation by acknowledging that we were a very fortunate family and if we are content, then why should we expect more? But I am sure that this was to allow us more a suitable temperament for when my father should return home and join us for dinner. But indeed, I, I was happy and I had the most wonderful childhood. Well, I felt truly loved by both of my parents. I have no doubt that, that my mother was influenced to speak about certain topics by her sister, Miss O'Dwyer. Similarly, it is with my dear Aunt Annie, where I was truly inspired to delve deeper into political complexities and to explore the argument in support of women acquiring fairness and equality in all matters relating to the laws of the land. Mabel struggled sleeping again last night. I cradled her, reciting some poetry for the better part of three hours before she settled. Fortunately, we did not wake Ada. She has a meeting today with uh, Miss Clarkson and Miss O'Dwyer to discuss how to increase the numbers of women in support of the petition. My wife's energy astounds me. Not only does she nurture our baby daughter, but also my own tired soul. <laughs> 
She is, without question, a remarkable woman. Encouraging me to speak about Catherine and the anguish I felt after her death. She has been my salvation. Catherine was consistent in her motivation and had a political mind. I agreed overwhelmingly with her that, as a man, I had the benefit of a sacrosanct position in society as clergy to sensitively broach such narrative in my sermons. She would also introduce me to various women of stature at garden party events and galas in order to realise strong and compatible alliances. The Reverend has such a way with him that most, if not all, of our congregation at the Unitarian gatherings are captivated and impassioned by him. His consistent, informed and thoughtful rhetoric has been a great source of comfort to many women. He has even convinced some of the gentlemen folk, the ones that I previously deemed impervious to our plight, to empathise and understand the essentialness and enormity of our task. With my Aunt Anne, Miss Clarkson and other respectable women and men, I feel protected by their strength and wisdom in such matters. I spoke of my thoughts surrounding my sister at luncheon when I felt it relevant to do so. Whilst I know my aunt and Miss Clarkson would wish me to speak freely, I am still all too aware of the conventions that defined my formative years. I began by addressing Miss Clarkson, and she gently responded, Call me Clara, my dear Mary. She listened intently as I spoke of my sister, and I admitted to feeling a small amount of guilt at being favoured so by her. I said I had no doubt that Emily would interrogate me the moment I arrived back home, but that I would not disclose any information about the petition or its progress, as is my instinct. My aunt said my instinct served me well but that the trick is to disclose just enough to inspire and intrigue, but omit actual plans to guard against derailment. Clara said Emily was welcome at her home, but that the meeting was confidential in nature due to the petition and surrounding events. We were meeting to arrange a gala in support of the petition and get more support and, and more interest, as one does when one feels a cause is worthy of effort and resources. Clara asked me if I would be willing and to have the confidence to speak at the event if I chose to do so. My aunt nodded at this to show her approval. <laughs> I, I was elated to be considered in such a way. <laughs> to be given the responsibility and opportunity to speak about the importance of a woman's voice. My mind was running away with the possibilities. How could I convey my passion without being deemed hysterical? Would I be able to list the benefits of including women on the vote because women are people too, without becoming tongue-tied? Or my worst fear, should I be shouted down or pelted with unsavoury items? My aunt must have registered all of this on my facial expression because she calmly said that she would be stood on one side of me and that Miss Clarkson would be stood on the other. And should anything occur, they would guide and shield me as necessary. Young men were to be employed as a sort of protection, but that all should be amicable considering it was a Unitarian gala. I asked them why they wished me to speak, and Clara said that I was the younger generation, and that it falls to those with youth and determination on their side to defy convention if that convention is flawed, and to challenge into submission that which is not fair or just. My aunt continued and said that she would assist me in making notes for my address. 
but only if I requested it of her. She was unequivocally sure that I would be more than capable on my own. My cousin Anne and her niece, Mary Louisa, are a tour de force. Their support of this movement has been tremendous. I rather think they have bonded over this in a very unique way, as have we all. Dear Anne is a beacon of light I have seldom encountered in life. She is prolific in her involvement in all areas of betterment. Her compassion towards the forgotten and ignored in our society, including our poor and our animals, is worthy of the highest recognition. I support her in these endeavours wholeheartedly. And although a considerable amount of time is now dominated with the petition, we do still achieve our goals for the provision of essentials for those desperately in need. I imagine some husbands would feel quite perturbed to discover that we operate under the guise of these meetings to educate those not so fortunate to experience an education. And similarly to update our women on the progress of our campaign. My adored friend, Annie O'Dwyer, whom I have known for over 30 years, ever since she began tutoring me in the art of French grammar and other languages, continues to be a pinnacle of learning. She is by far the most exotic in our group in respect of her enviable intellect, yet she exudes such an affable nature. This has been such an asset to our collaborative goal as she has attracted the less confident and vulnerable amongst our women. We have then enabled them through these meetings to realise their potential and their worth. I must admit I've been rather preoccupied recently. You see, several months ago I received an invitation from one of my church acquaintances to join her at a meeting which I enjoyed very much and where such heartened ladies spoke so passionately about matters concerning women's suffrage. I was totally enthralled by these informed women explaining with such conviction why we should be given the vote, that I decided to attend the meetings on a regular basis and I too have become committed to campaign for women's suffrage. Our campaigning is all above board and within the law and whilst at a rally or event we're always together supporting each other. In fact the women's support gives me the strength to continue with my campaigning, so much so that I have personally written letters to three members of parliament this past month expressing my views. I explained how I'm a good wife, a caring mother to three children, a supporter of my local church, and I work hard as a dressmaker but despite all of these contributions I make to society, just like many other women do, I expressed how unjust it is that women are still not allowed to have a say in any of the laws which affect women, or women's work, or children. Oh, and how frustrating it is not to be heard, and not to be asked if I am happy with any of these laws, Giving women the right to vote means that our opinions and wishes are valued and taken into account by Parliament. For me, this cause has become a much larger part of my life. I so look forward to attending the next meeting or talk and being able to share views with the women all of whom I deeply admire for their strength of character and passion. It was a momentous time for us as a group of women because we had been fighting and fighting for our voices to be heard always. 
always ignored by those in power. I've longed to be part of, of such a movement. All the while, I could barely conceive how such an insurmountable task could be achieved with such opposition from women in my own constituent. It has caused me such vexation, their unwillingness to understand the basic human condition, that we all need to be embraced, we all need to feel valued enough to be heard and to have impact on the decisions that affect us. Men rule Parliament, and for many, this is not to be questioned. My thoughts, however, that women should have impact on matters of import have not been dissuaded. And my question for those who feel that this is a radical way of thinking is, how can we as women be expected to contribute to society, our households, pay taxes and contribute to the law when we have no say in who creates these laws and who dictates them. If women can get more power in our parliament, if our voices can be heard, then we can stand up and speak on behalf of those that do not have any kind of voice our orphans, our working class women, our animals. It makes me feel so frustrated that the animals have nothing. And if I can petition a woman who has a place in parliament, if I can express my feelings about equal rights and equal values as a woman, then maybe change will come. It amuses me to think that if for a time women only gave birth to girls, then well, we would soon be forced to deviate female rule. But in all seriousness, to bear and to nurture a child you must be strong of mind and body. And it is a travesty that great expectation is placed upon us to play our part in this respect, only to be excluded in other areas of importance. Goodwin and I do speak about adding to our family, but we also need to be assured that, that our children will grow up in a society that is fair to both men and women. Time is not on our side. Yet I feel confident that the tide of change is. I will not be the one to complete the journey. But with her help and the continued assistance of some truly inspirational women, in this town, which I now call my home, I will have made a few steps in the right direction. I am so fortunate to have these women as part of my most trusted inner circle. In a way, they are all my family. Being the only surviving sibling has been a somewhat lonely existence as my parents have been departed for some years now. My brother I miss immensely. I know in my heart that if he still lived and breathed, he would support my views. He once divulged to me that I had a quiet resilience and determination that would show the world what could be achieved by a woman. When the opportunity came to sign the petition, I chose to hold my head high and walk with the other women from our chapel and place my name on that parchment. The people of this town wonder why I never married, because I am not prepared 
to have myself subsumed into another's name. Forevermore, my name will be on that document, not my husband's. The world is made up of women and men. Without one, the other cannot exist. How then can women be seen as so unimportant? There is a fundamental lack of reason here. How is half the nation supposed to speak for the entirety of it? We must stand together in the face of this resistance. For our daughters and for our daughters' daughters, and for the sake of our men folk who, who love and support them and want them to succeed. I therefore support this petition to address the social injustice in our systems. Imagine the good that we can do, the changes that we can make. I just hope and wish to live to see that day. The humble petition of the undersigned showeth that it having been expressly laid down by high authorities that the possession of property in this country carries with it the right to vote in the election of representatives in Parliament, it is an evident anomaly that some holders of property are allowed to use this right, while others, forming no less a constituent part of the nation, and equally qualified by law to hold property, are not able to exercise this privilege that the participation of women in the government is consistent with the principles of the British Constitution. Inasmuch as women in these islands have always been held capable of sovereignty and women are eligible for various public offices, your petitioners therefore humbly pray your Honourable House to consider the expediency of providing for the representation of all householders without distinction of sex who possess such property or rental qualification as your Honourable House may determine. And your petitioners will ever pray. And your petitioners will ever pray. And your petitioners will ever pray.